Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granick allen Every year on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, we honor the fallen from the First World War and the many wars since, and we think of all those who serve in Canada's defense. We wear poppies as a remembrance of their sacrifice, and this year is the 101st anniversary of the poppy. And speaking of the poppy, this year the Canadian Legion is going green by introducing a biodegradable version of the red flower, previously, I guess, made out of thin plastic. And with COVID more or less behind us, we hope to see many more poppies, parades, and commemorations in honor of our fallen. But is Canada doing justice to our history? Do our children know what Canada sacrificed for their freedom? Are we honoring that sacrifice by safeguarding those hard-fought freedoms? Well, joining me now to share his knowledge on the history of Canada's Great War, Canada's sacrifice, and remembrance in general, is author, filmmaker, and writer John Robson. John, thank you so much for joining me today, and I'm, I'm always grateful to have you on because I feel like you really do demonstrate and, and beautifully illustrate why we as Canadians need to really honor Remembrance Day. So thank you so much. And so maybe I'll start with that very general question. Why is it important that we commemorate Mem Remembrance Day? It seems to me that it's important for a number of reasons. And the first of them is to understand that the way of life that we enjoy uh, it was not something to which we are entitled, that just happened naturally, and that if we simply go about our business thinking, ha, huh, you know, I'm worth it, that that it'll continue. We are here today because of people who risked and in some cases lost everything rather than give in to bullying and tyranny to people who did answer the call and who knew that there were things more important than life itself. And we live in a society that I think is lacking in a number of uh, important qualities. And one of them, in fact, is gratitude. So I think there's a, a rather broader point here about Remembrance Day as being one in a number of ways that we can remember to be grateful, to understand that we have received more than we were entitled to. And, you know, I appreciate the introduction you gave me, but I do think it's important to point out that I've never worn a uniform, that I am somebody who appreciates what he has been given, but I am not you know, I, I don't belong in the first or even second row here. I am uh, very much a spectator applauding the veterans. And I think it's also interesting that in some sense it's been brought home because of what's happened in Ukraine. Right. And one of the things about the war in Ukraine is that when it started, it looked as though it was going to be heroic but futile. And we admired the Ukrainians for taking up arms in the face of certain defeat by the Russian juggernaut. And instead, it appears as though it is this Russian juggernaut that's going down in flames. But I, when you invited me to come on the show, I was reminded of a, sm a small film clip that I did eight or nine years ago while doing the, the Constitutional Trilogy. And it was filmed in Britain. It's one of these obscure kind of hill forts that had been used as a strong place in times of trouble from the Bronze Age on. And I was thinking to myself about the number of small political entities facing danger and devastation, people who had rallied in these very small places in small numbers, um, forgotten. The history right. has no idea who they were or what they fought for. Uh, and many of them were defeated. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to digress a bit into the Lord of the Rings here, because in Tolkien's backstory, you have the Dunedain of the North and their kingdom, particularly of Arthedain, that fights a losing battle against the witch king of Angmar and so forth. But um, in some sense, it contributes to the larger victory. And we have to remember that so many of the people who took up arms did so in the face of probable or even certain defeat, yes. thinking somehow something would be salvaged, even from a cause that was indeed lost, like the sack of Rome, things of this sort. And also on, on a much smaller scale, I mean, we focus on the world wars in Korea, and rightly so, but we shouldn't forget not only other conflicts like the Napoleonic Wars or the you know defeat of the Spanish Armada, um, the the Saxons who fought against the Normans in 1066. In fact, it was more or less the Saxon uh, form of government that prevailed. But the Battle of Hastings was lost, and uh, it could have been a catastrophe. 
And again, all these people who fought in much smaller engagements and when things we've forgotten in major wars and things we've forgotten in minor wars, there's so many occasions on right. which people have found. And, and again, you think about going into battle and it's it, it's like try diving off a three meter board and see how scared you are. And then imagine, you know, jumping out of a trench into machine gun fire or something like that. It is It is just astonishing that so many people found within themselves the resources that were necessary to do the thing that they knew they should do. Welcome back if for the theme of remembrance, because we are approaching Remembrance Day here. I'm joined by John Robson, who's an author, filmmaker, and writer. And John, just before commercial break, um, you know, you know so much about history and you've shared and beautifully illustrated so many other battles in which you know, Canadians or our ancestors in a faraway lands have contributed and, and fought for these um, hard-fought freedoms and our and the quality of life and our, our liberties that we enjoy today. And I feel like so many of us don't know our history. Why are some of those earlier battles before World War I so important? It, it's because if it weren't for the victory, say, at Waterloo, uh, there could have been no victory in World War I because Britain would have been defeated. And again, thinking about history, it's remarkable to reflect that Waterloo is just over 100 years before Vimy Ridge. And Vimy Ridge is just over 100 years before the present. And so to the men who fought in the First World War, Waterloo was as sort of historically remote, but as hist also as historically close as Vimy Ridge is to us today. And then you look back beyond that to the you know the Battle of Blenheim and things like that. Uh, and, and then further back to the Armada, and then you you keep going back in time. You know, thinking about poor Richard the Third, killed at Bosworth Field, last English king to die in battle. And then this takes us back to the wars over Magna Carta, because there were wars over Magna Carta. King John, once he'd sealed it, tried to get out of it. Um, and then, but you go back, and Alfred the Great is another of these figures that I wish people would remember more clearly. The Saxon king who in the ninth century managed to prevent the pagan uh, invaders from destroying civilization in the United, oh, what was the, you know, then Britain or in fact Wessex. Um, and, but also the people like King Arthur, right? Who's, who's actually based on a historical figure who fought for Roman Britain uh, unsuccessfully against the Saxons, but not completely unsuccessfully. All of these things are necessary for there to be a victory in World War II. Again, if we had not won in World War I, we wouldn't have won in World War II. There are so many and so many improbable victories uh, that, as with so many things in this life, you have to say to yourself, I'm actually incredibly lucky. And who am I just to use up the luck instead of making sure that I pass it on? To try right. to leave the world not much worse than I found it, or even ideally, perhaps a little bit better. And, uh, and I think that it's uh, Remembrance Day is a good way of, of thinking about what I, this debt that I owe to people who I can never repay, and then what obligation exists for me to appreciate my good fortune and try to live up to their sacrifice in some way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, I'm, again, I've never worn a uniform. No one is going to ask me at this point to withstand a bayonet charge. Uh, but I can at least know that somebody else did it for me. And say, well, uh, that that actually creates an obligation on me to right. cultivate and cherish, including attempting to preserve the memory of it. Yes. Um, and you mentioned and, gratitude. And I, if I have a quick moment. Yes, go um, ahead. There's two things. One of my children gave me a book of firsthand accounts of World War One, And one thing I discovered, J.R.O. Tolkien fought in the war with the Lancashire Fusiliers on the Somme. And one section of their trench lines was cut into very chalky soil. And they called it the White City, which shows up in Gondor. But there was another story of somebody watching the, them going over the top in the first day of the Somme, and some guy gets out into no man's land with this shells and murderous fire, realizes his cigarette has gone out and stops to relight it. And you think to yourself, what a, what a human, if possibly ill-advised moment. They go to who that guy was. He's like, hey, wait a minute, my cigarette's gone out. God, I can't attack without that and lighting it. <laughs> um, but very, very normal and ordinary people who did extraordinary things. And we should always remember that. And remember, too, we, too, can do extraordinary things. We, too, can face the challenges. We can swallow the fear, though we can't get rid of it, and do the things that we know must be done, even though they look very scary and the prospect of success looks small. 
You don't well, how do, how do we do that, though? How do we instill that into my generation, the next generation, your generation, when we know that that is a debt, you're right, that we could never repay? We could never repay. Who in their right mind walks into a line of fire with certain death in front of them? Well, our ancestors did to preserve our freedoms. How do we instill yeah, I, I, that? Thousands of people. There's a, a, a monument to the Indian Corps in the uh, British forces in World War One, and there's you know all the wall with all the names of those with no known grave, and every single one of those men was a volunteer who'd gone halfway around the world to do this because they knew it was right. And I think one of the things that we do actually, and this is is a general obligation, but is reinforced by these considerations. Uh, as I had in my quote of the day the other day, we face things with no sophistry in our mouths and no masks on our faces. We say, I will tell the truth, especially I'm not going to get shot for telling the truth, unlike a lot of people. We will not deliberately acquiesce in any kind of lie, including lies about our history, lies about things that are happening today. Right. We will not become surly, bitter, or paranoid, but we will also not be afraid. Thank you again for joining me, John. Just before commercial, you shared a, a very poignant quote. Um, and unpack a little bit of that, because there, there were a lot of important things you said there. It's actually the concluding line of uh, James Fitzjames Stevens' book, um, so Liberty, Equality, and Something. I'm sorry, I'm now I've, I've forgotten the exact title, but uh, it, it was the end of the book, and he said, you know, life is very uncertain. We do not know if there is a right course forward. We do not, in his case, he said, we don't know if there's an afterlife or anything, so what are we going to do? And he said, we're going to hold our heads high and we're going to tell the truth. And when you think of the fact that people did manage to go over the top in those attacks or withstand the shell fire, and it was artillery that accounted for more than half the casualties in the war. If we told them that we had lied because we were afraid the school board would chew us out. If we said we have worn a mask because we were afraid to tell the government that it didn't understand the science. If we have pretended to believe in a climate change scare that we don't in our hearts believe in, and I'm not talking about if you believe in it, then do something about it. But if you don't, don't pretend. Do not say that I have been given the privilege of acting like a coward in a situation that's actually extremely safe. I think that is something we all must avoid. Uh, and, and again, more than anything, it was Solzhenitsyn, I think it was said about communism, that if everyone had told the truth for one day, it would have collapsed. Right. Well, telling the truth in the Soviet Union was going to get you killed, very possibly, uh, put in a mental hospital and injected with terrible drugs. Really, really awful things could happen to you. In Canada, very little that's really awful will happen to you if you tell the truth. So why don't we make sure that we do it? And again, there's no need to be unpleasant. We're trying to get people to see the light. Um, we're not trying to drive them further into the darkness, but just to say, I have inherited the freedom that they fought for at Vimy Ridge and that they fought for at Hastings and that they fought for in all these places and sometimes on the wrong side. I mean, the Battle of Culloden Moor, I admire the Highlanders charging barefoot, although I think they should have got shoes, but they were on the wrong side. They deserved a better cause, but they were fighting for freedom as they understood it. And when people have done these kinds of things, I think that we should not excuse flinching. Hmm. What do you mean Including by flinching? Including our history. Go to Remembrance Day ceremonies. Stand up and say, this is a history worth celebrating. Yes, you can point to flaws in Canada's history. We're an open society. We admit our faults. We try to fix them. Yes, there were things that were wrong, and we're not going to pretend there weren't. That right. too would be a lie. But you will not tell us we have no history or that we are a genocidal settler state that we have that we are carrying out a genocide. We apparently we're supposed to be carrying out a genocide now, the prime minister seems to think. And when you think about the fact that though our policies were misguided, they were not the Holocaust or the Holodomor or any of these terrible things that really have happened. I think we just need to stand up and say, I will not acquiesce in that lie, even by my silence. What you said is untrue, and I know it is untrue, and it matters. And I will tell the children, no, that is not what Canada was. It is not what Canada is. And to make Canada, keep Canada a place where we want to live and where people want to come to, we must celebrate what is good in our history and correct what is bad, not make up an evil fairy tale in which Canada is the ogre. This is just but but how does one do that, John, when you know you alluded to that the Prime Minister seems to be headed down a different path, that it is not politically correct to say such things, that the political correct thing is to head hang your head uh, in shame 
for what went on during very dark points, and of course not looking to whitewash any of our history. But uh, you know that we have done bad things, and there have been some bad things. But how does one move forward in remembrance, in gratitude to what our what you know our ancestors and and all those who fought ahead of us for our freedoms, while still acknowledging those wrong periods of time? I think what one does is, is just to tell the story as it truly happened, to remember all of it. And I, well, there's one particular story, I bring this up frequently. It's the story of King Canute, and it's one of the few things that we do remember, but we usually mangle it. You know, he's the guy who thought he could stop the tide. <laughs> but the real story about Canute is that it was his courtiers who were telling him that he was such a great king and so beloved of God that he could even command the waves. Mm. So he said, really? Take my chair down to the mudflats at low tide and we'll test that. And when the tide started coming in, he said, halt, I am Canute the Great. And it, of course, poured into his boots and soaked his feet. And then he turned to his courtiers and said, look, I'm the king. I get flattery all the time. I don't even have to pay for it. You have to tell me the truth, including what I'm doing wrong, or how can I govern these people justly and properly? And he added, do not forget that there is only one who can command the waves, and that is God. Wow. And so, and you can tell that story. And you can also explain that Canute was king because the Anglo-Saxon kings, especially Ethelred the Unready, was weak, mean, evil, and treacherous. And so the Danes came in. Uh, you know, you can remember the bad stuff about history. And again, you obviously, you can remember that there was a lot of racism in Canada's past and so on. Uh, and this is part of how people who were in many ways good people fell short. I'm going to cut right there. We're going to come right back just in one moment. Welcome back. We're wrapping up our discussion with John Robson here as we commemorate remembrance. John, so many Canadians uh, use the word freedom. Freedom is a, is a beautiful word and a, and a wonderful word. And we have many freedoms in Canada. And there have been many Canadians during this time of COVID who feel perhaps some of their freedoms and liberties have been sidelined or relegated. And, you know, when we're discussing in this beautiful conversation about, you know, the the multi century history in, in in achieving these freedoms and why that was so important. How do we, given the the current climate, how do we help Canadians understand the importance of freedom and and how to never give up on that? It is uh, it's certainly a challenge, and I think it always has been. It's good to remember that this has never been an easy thing to do. But I think we want to remember that the national anthem calls us the true north, strong and free. We want to remember Wilfred Laurier saying Canada is free and freedom is its nationality. We want to understand how critical a part of the founding self-understanding of Canada was. And, you know, again, we want to commemorate wars, not start them on this occasion. But I one thing about the truckers' convoy protest that was interesting is that they made the Canadian flag a symbol of freedom, not just in Canada, but around the world. This was an extraordinary and I think very positive thing. I know there are, you know, there are arguments on both sides. And I, I know some people feel very strongly that there was a threat of anarchy. But I also know a lot of people feel it's amazing how we acquiesce in governments closing places of worship and imposing all kinds of restrictions on us, including, you know, they talked about your body, your choice, blah, blah, blah. And then suddenly it turned out that wasn't really true. Mm. Uh, but one of the things that did maybe we can unite around is this idea that Canadians should be free and that freedom carries with it responsibility. So it's not license. It's not anarchy. But let us remember that the Canadian flag is a symbol of freedom. And perhaps wind up by remembering for how many Dutch people it was the arrival of the maple leaf and the old flag, let's not forget, that meant the Nazi tyranny had ended and they were again free. And this is such a stirring part of Canada's history. If we tell people, and it doesn't matter where your ancestors are from or where you came from if you've chosen Canada, this is your story now. And this is a story to bring tears to your eyes. It is so thrilling. It is so exciting. And it's your story. And you are now on stage. And you have a part to play. And this is something to be grateful for and to celebrate. So with, you know, the Remembrance Day celebrations just here, how... How can we encourage our younger generations to, I'm a mother, I have five children, I'm always trying my very best to help them understand history, you know, at, at a level they can relate to. How, what is the best way to get the younger generation to not banalize this very important day? I think for the very youngest people, uh, and moving on probably well into their teens, it's personal memoirs. The stories of people and the things they did. I mean, the Diary of Anne Frank, of course, there's a, a book that's called Angel House, something about these uh, 
girls who were hidden by Catholic nuns in, in Eastern Europe. And then you think it's just too good to be true. And at the end, the author says, and that was my aunt. And now, you know, she moved to Canada. Uh, the George Blackburn's memoirs of being a soldier in the Second World War, getting people to, to feel the adventure in that firsthand kind of way. And later they can uh, appreciate it in a more abstract manner. But it's, again, reading the memoirs of soldiers, and, and again, this the good humor with which they faced the terror is yes. one of the things that I think is just remarkable to see. And then you start to, you know, in your head, you imagine yourself facing danger, not just with fortitude, but with a smile or even a smirk. Uh, these these kinds of stories about kind of going through flak and holes in the wings, and then one of the uh, men on the plane commented, brother, I say, I think you've bent the airplane. Uh, who among us doesn't dream of getting off a line like that as smoke billows through the cockpit? Um, and, and there are so many amazing stories. Again, there's one that of a, a, a Polish fighter who'd gotten out of Poland and become an RAF pilot, and he was shot down over the channel. Didn't know if he was in England or France, but he landed in his parachute. And then he saw these guys kind of weaving toward him like they were drunk. He started going toward them, and they fired a shotgun at him. So, ah! And then he he waited and they got closer. He stepped again, another shotgun blast. Finally got close enough, and he shouted in broken, accented English, which doesn't sound good, right? He's telling you in German. He says, No, <laughs> Polish, RAF. And the guy goes, Yeah, I know that, mate. Sorry about shooting at you, but you're standing in a minefield. I had to get you to keep still. <laughs> oh There's so much magic in this of, of what people did under these terrible circumstances and finding light in the darkness. There is so much that should excite young people. Yes. This is a truer history than the most fantastic story. And yet it's also more interesting. I mean, it, it's this is a wonderful heritage. We have something exciting for them. And I think we should present it to them with pride and with enthusiasm. Absolutely. John, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for your insights today. And my pleasure. And with that, happy Remembrance Day.